Honoring Collectivism with Dr. Ivana Draskovic. Ivana, I'm really delighted to have you speaking to me again, and um, I want to invite you to talk about collectivism and your experience of collectivism from your cultural perspective, and also from working with lots of refugees and how that comes into play in terms of your practice. Well, thank you for that question. Um, that's a big, big dilemma, right? Do we come from collectivism? perspective and approach people individualistic. And I think there's a danger if we if we define that just within the prescribed terms, I always go back to prescription. Um, because I think there there is a possibility to bridge mm -hmm. two different lenses. I come from a collectivist culture. I come from a culture where your neighbor sometimes knew more than your mother did or it, there was never an instance when I was be coming back from being out in a city and coming up my street and not seeing my parents sitting with the neighbors and socializing and having coffee. So collectivist, collectivism, where I come from, uh, it involves very much family or neighbors, like your, your co-workers. There was no uh, delineation, I guess, between um, all these people. And on the other hand, when we came to Canada, uh, I think we were over, overwhelmed by, by not knowing who our neighbors are. Um, I live now in an area where I know maybe three of my neighbors, but we're not very close in any way. Um, and it's very individualistic society. So, so I think that people but, but whenever, I guess what I'm trying to say, it was really overwhelming for my parents to not be able to share with the neighbors. Um, it was very different. But anytime I talked to anybody, uh, the feedback that I would get is that they were lonely and that they needed more connection with people and so on. And, and that's an underlying message, I think, especially now in pandemic that we now know truly what individualism, individualistic way of life means because we are so closed off mm -hmm. from others that that breeds loneliness and it breeds disconnection and fear and all kinds of anxieties. So when I talk about this to my students and say, well, generally the question I ask in the class is, what do you think is the best way to approach a culturally diverse client? How, how would you approach them? Would you favor individualistic lens or collectivist lens? I get the response that the mixture of both is the best. And so I think that that means that if we are bridging these two worldviews, we need to open up doors for clients to bring people with them physically or in spirit or psychologically into the sessions and we need to honor that. And sometimes we have to fly by the seat of our pants, right? Because sometimes I would go to get the client from the waiting room and there are five people there and all of them are coming in and I'm scrambling up for chairs and whatnot, but I'm known not to ever refuse um, Yeah. So if the client is bringing their parents and their brothers and sisters, they'll figure out where we're going to sit and we're going to talk. Um, if the client is bringing uh, people with her um, in a spiritual way, we will honor it. Um, I just think that that if, uh, if, if the client is bringing certain struggles and they need to connect with cultural healers or elders or religious um, leaders in their community, we're going to figure out a way how we can do that. Sometimes in the pandemic days, um, we would either go to an elder spiritual healer or, or religious um, leader and, and have a meeting. Sometimes the client will do that on their own. These days online, everything is even more possible. So oftentimes I'm invited to join. So that works for me. But oftentimes I also, when the client is not open to creating uh, that collective atmosphere, still um, I step out and, and let the client kind of lead the way. But my general experience is that 
we, we're going to work with the systems no matter what. Whether so, we already have to embrace collectivism. Whether there's one person in a session or ten, you are working with multiple people, and I don't think we can survive if we don't learn to build relationships with each other and we don't learn to survive together. I don't think that as species we will survive because we are not really relational. And with that, I think that building more collectivism in our communities is what we need. Um, we, we cannot survive on our own for long periods of time. Even some of us, like I'm not a very social person because I have so many other interests, but I'm craving people um, in this pandemic. Like I crave this, this was awesome. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I, I would say my message to students and counselors is to embrace whatever, uh, whoever comes into the office and, and remember that we are collective by nature. The question I was going to ask you at the end was what tips would you give to students when they walk out to the waiting room and there's five people instead of the one person they're expecting? What are kind of three simple things that they can do to embrace that experience? Introduce yourself, mm -hmm. number one. Welcome people into your office and open up space for conversation and give everybody enough space to, to talk about why they're there. And my experiences have been that sometimes people come in to give me a peace of mind and share something that's culturally relevant for them. Sometimes they come in just for support and, and they just sit in silence. But for me, it's tell them who you are, you know, and wel welcome them no matter what and uh, open up space for, for conversation. Knowledge is power. Um, and if we know about each other, we are gonna be able to support each other um, in better ways. And so welcome, welcome people. Thank you, Ivana. That's, uh, that's uh, very helpful advice. And I think that it, um, it comes back again to the whole focus that we're talking about here is being willing to be in relationship and yeah. and in the moment in relationship and i think that the thing that has come from talking with you is recognizing that that relationships are not static they no. change they evolve they move mm -hmm. and our ability to be in relationship is about being able to be present in the moment and flexible and yeah. responsive to what's happening with whoever is there with us. Um, they're continuous. They never, ever, um, they never, ever stop. They may change the direction and nature and they may become really difficult. But for me, the relationships are continuous even when they end. And therapeutic relationships end, but what continues on with people and with you changes you. Well, I appreciate this relationship with you Thank and you. your investment in this relational process with these um, people who will access this resource. Likewise, because I do feel, and we talked about this before, and this is maybe the message that I would leave for students, is that uh, my biggest fear is that the way we used to do therapy and build relationships is getting lost, is getting lost in technology and these quick programs and, you know, ways of, of, of addressing people's problems that almost is losing that human component. I miss building relationships with clients face to face and, and, and doing all of those simple things that are not anymore considered even interventions. And they are probably the most important interventions of them all. Building relationships, unconditional positive regard, cultural empathy, openness, willingness, social justice, those are things that matter, mm -hmm. something else, but these are the things that change people fundamentally. So I hope that we'll, we'll be able to preserve it. Well, we are working on it in this moment. Thank, Thank you. you.